his death wish came true. Ex-con Garland Tyree made Good Friday on his bow of a fight to the fatal finish, dying in a shootout with police after an intense six-hour standoff, officials said. Today I'd die, the career criminal declared in a chilling Facebook post about an hour after he ignited a smoke grenade and pumped two bullets into an FDNY lieutenant as a routine arrest went wildly awry. The deadly day began around 5.45 a.m. when a team of city cops and federal marshals tried to grab Tyree, a high-ranking member of the notorious Blood Street Gang, who traveled to the Bahamas, a violation of his parole. A police source said the trip was tied to a drug deal. The Staten Island drama ended shortly after noon when their doomed and deranged target, in a bulletproof vest, charged up the steps from his Staten Island basement apartment with his AK-47 blazing. Minutes later, Tyree's bullet-riddled body was lying on the ground outside the apartment entrance. Tyree had served nearly two decades behind bars and vowed never to return. We can't sugarcoat who he was and I won't do that, said a man who referred to Tyree as S.I. S.I. was the godfather of the nine Trey gangsters. I was a part of that with him so I know his history, the first adolescent bloods. So we're talking about 1993 to 1994, he's etched in the history of New York City. He came out firing numerous rounds, said the NYPD chief of the Special Operations Division at the time. Our officers immediately returned fire. Seven of the 25 emergency services unit cops surrounding the home fired a Tyree, according to police sources. Tyree's last words were to his mother, who was flown north by NYPD helicopter from Delaware in hopes of a peaceful resolution to an increasingly nerve-wracking situation. The two spent three minutes chatting on the phone before Tyree announced his plans to surrender. He said to his mother, I'm coming out now, mama, I love you, said a police hostage negotiator. It was very sweet. Instead, Tyree, 38, began firing through a basement window, hitting a police vehicle and a neighbor's car, before emerging from his subterranean lair with the assault weapon and shooting at cops behind protective shields. His mother and one of his sisters were led away from the multiple family home, weeping and screaming, when the shooting stopped. Cops recovered three handguns in addition to the AK-47 from the dead man's apartment, along with a pair of magazines loaded with more than 100 rounds of ammunition. Tyree, or S.I., was born in Long Branch, New Jersey, on May 2, 1977. He moved with his family to Staten Island later that year. His parents separated when he was very young and he was raised by his mother and stepfather. The family never owned its home and was not well off, but they weren't destitute either. During a 2006 forensic evaluation, Tyree told a psychologist that his stepfather worked two or three jobs to provide for the family and that his mother was mostly a housewife. She was physically abusive, particularly toward his older brother, had a crack cocaine problem, and was hospitalized for psychiatric treatment throughout his early childhood, he said. Tyree reported that he nonetheless loved both his mother, who had since gotten clean, and stepfather, who died in 2008, but said he had no relationship with his biological father and had not seen him since he was four years old. He told the psychologist that he was placed in a group home as a preteen due to his mother's abusive behavior and drug use and spent approximately five months at Kings County Psychiatric Hospital after a near-suicide attempt when he was 12. Upset that his mother failed to show up for a scheduled visit at the group home, Tyree reported that he barricaded a door so no one could get in and then unscrewed the window guards and contemplated jumping. He was institutionalized at least two other times as a child, once at the Geller House and once at South Beach Psychiatric Hospital, but had not received any mental health treatment since he was 13, according to his 2006 psychological evaluation. His first brush with the law came around age 13, when he was charged with joyriding in a stolen car and sent to a juvenile detention center. At 16, he was charged in three separate shootings, one of which was fatal, according to Advance Archives. The fatal shooting, which occurred on December 17, 1993, happened outside of a vacant apartment on Brook Street, where neighborhood kids held parties. According to his moms, her son asked to search a young man who was not from the neighborhood before he entered a party, and the man shot her son, rather than comply with the pat-down. Tyree, who had been wearing a bulletproof vest at his mother's insistence, fell to the ground, but managed to return fire and kill the man, who was identified as 19-year-old James Laurent. Allegedly, his mom had her then-teenage son wear a bulletproof vest as a condition of leaving the house in those days because of frequent gunplay in the neighborhood. 
Shortly after his 18th birthday, Tyree pleaded guilty to two felony counts of criminal weapon possession and one count of felony assault to satisfy the charges stemming from the shootings and a slashing incident that occurred during a fight with another teen inmate aboard a corrections department bus. A judge sentenced him to one and a half to four and a half years in prison, but he caught additional assault cases while locked up and ended up doing eight and a half years, corrections records show. His prison disciplinary record during that time contains a litany of violent offenses including multiple slashings, fist fights and weapons confiscations. In one instance, while in the Federal Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, he cut a fellow inmate, inflicting a gash that required 60 stitches to close. He ripped him. It was in state prison that Tyree said he joined the Bloods because gang membership was necessary for protection. Many of his violent prison incidents were gang-related, records show. I was fearful back then, young and put in a violent environment, he told a forensic psychologist in 2006. I didn't want to get hurt. Shortly before he maxed out his state prison sentence in 2002, a parole board member told him, glibly, please don't shoot anybody else, if you can refrain from shooting and slashing people, that will be good. That was in March 2002, after he served the maximum sentence for assault and weapons charges in the aforementioned slaying, shooting a woman in the foot, and slashing an inmate during a prison transfer. Tyree was released from prison in June 2002, at age 25, but was rearrested on weapons charges less than two weeks later, after police raided his childhood friend's home, where he had been crashing. Cops found guns and ammunition under the mattress in the bedroom where Tyree and his then-girlfriend were sleeping, and he was indicted a few months later. He strenuously denied that the guns belonged to him and, rather than accept a plea deal, took the case to trial, where his childhood friend, who went by the street name, and testified against him. Tyree was convicted in May 2004 and sentenced in 2006 to 10 years in prison, followed by three years of supervised release. He had another six months tacked on to his sentence in 2007, after pleading guilty to a lock and sock assault of an inmate he believed was a government cooperator. His childhood friend, Anne, who was free during the time, would later get into trouble with the law. Let's talk a little bit about that. So, Anne led a violent crew that distributed large amounts of crack and powder cocaine in New Springville and in New Jersey, according to the feds. After operating in New Jersey in 2007, Anne shifted the crew's base of operations to Staten Island in 2008, according to the indictment against him. He was accused of distributing significant amounts of crack and powder cocaine to Staten Island customers until he and other crew members were arrested in 2009. Anne's crew was involved in at least six Staten Island shootings. Anne had been previously convicted for weapons and narcotics trafficking and had admitted to having been involved in at least 20 shootings and 14 robberies, facilitated the acquisition of firearms, including handguns, an SK-47 and a Tommy gun, for all members of the crew, according to federal prosecutors, who said the takedown resulted in the arrests of a dozen people and the seizure of $400,000 in assets, narcotics and weapons. In 2010, he was sentenced to 27 years in prison. Let's get back to Tyree, who was incarcerated at the time. In spite of a spate of additional violent incidents during his second incarceration, and partially because of them, Tyree began educating himself and, in the process, flashed signs of an extraordinary intelligence. He was really, like, scary smart, said a criminal defense attorney who was appointed to defend Tyree after his 2002 arrest on gun charges and got to know him well over the course of the next decade. When he took the exam in 2004, he placed in the 99th percentile in every single category. As a result, Tyree convened a group of inmates and began holding GED tutoring classes. He also reported teaching prison classes on morals and judgment and history. Tyree went on to complete a law library clerk's course, earn an array of educational certificates in subjects like psychology, business ethics and critical thinking, and use his legal knowledge to assist other prisoners in their court appeals and civil suits. His scores on cognitive tests administered by a forensic psychologist while he was in prison were suggestive of high average to very superior intellectual functioning and as high and perhaps higher than scores typically obtained by individuals who receive advanced professional degrees. He began writing urban fiction novels in 2009, following a conversation about the genre with another inmate, and launched a publishing company shortly after being released from prison in 2012. 
Tyree published his first book, The Trey Way, in 2013, and was in the final stages of editing his second novel, Omar's Redemption, when he died. When he left prison for the second time, in 2012, Tyree appeared motivated to go to school, obtain honest work and give back to the community. He was admitted to the College of Staten Island, found a job at a restaurant, and became involved in local politics and community activism, assisting the Southeast Queens Young Democrats with a voter registration drive and autism awareness symposium, and volunteering for an organization that prepares convicted felons to re-enter the job market. At the same time, Tyree had become a leader in the Bloods and sported an NTG tattoo over his right eye for the Nine Trey Gangstas. He met with gang members at a Staten Island diner on August 20, 2012, the very day of his release from federal prison. Federal authorities contend that several Bloods members showed up, including Curtis Dodd, a top member of the Virginia-based Nine Trey Gangsters blood set. And, on February 11, 2013, allegedly, Tyree was present in a home on Stanley Avenue when another Bloods member was forced to shoot himself in the leg so he would be allowed to lead the gang. At some point, he'd get locked up on another charge, but was released from federal custody in July of 2014. Harry was on parole for just 13 months and was to be on parole through the following year before he died. That August day in 2015, Tyree was alone inside his home at the building on Destiny Court in the Mariner's Harbor section when the marshals arrived. One smoke began pouring from the basement, from a smoke grenade Tyree lobbed at the door, the federal agents called the FDNY. Fire Lieutenant James Hayes, a veteran, headed inside through the smoke to see if anyone was trapped and he was shot twice by Tyree. Hayes, struck in the buttocks and left calf, was listed in stable condition at Richmond University Medical Center. After blasting the unsuspecting firefighter, Tyree squeezed off another three shots at police without hitting anyone. Tyree provided a Facebook update, noting that cops kicked in my door and it popped off. This would lead up to the six-hour standoff that resulted in his death. His mom felt that Tyree was a good shot and if he wanted to shoot a police officer when he surrendered, he would have. She also felt that he would not have had her flown in from Delaware if his plans was to surrender in a blaze. Also, a nephew was present and she didn't believe that Tyree would want his nephew to see him killed. Even with that, she also admitted that she could not determine his mindset at the time. During negotiations, Tyree did say he was scared but that he takes life as it comes. After a few words, he said he had to go and that he phone battery was about to die. He didn't answer the phone anymore after that. But this about wraps it up for this one, and as always, stay low and thanks for watching.